All right. So on this first one, anytime you're given, oops, sorry, Jacob. Thank you. Anytime you're given a terminal ray in a quadrant, this sort of thing, definitely draw a picture. So your circle centered at the origin. Okay, has a radius of 13. We'll get to that. The terminal side intercepts the circle in quadrant 3. So there's your quadrant 3. When you draw that terminal ray, that's your radius. So that is 13. And then you always drop your triangle, your right triangle, to the x-axis. So there we have our right triangle. Our angle is always this angle created with kind of near the origin. The x-coordinate at point C is negative 5. So if the x-coordinate is negative 5, that means I came this way, negative 5. So then from here, if I want to know the value of the sine of theta, here's my angle. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. I need to know what my opposite is. So the Pythagorean theorem, negative 5 squared plus x squared equals 13 squared. This is the same thing as 25, so if I subtract 25 from both sides, x squared equals 169 minus 25 is 144. And then when you take the square root of both sides, x equals plus or minus 12. Which is it? Is this going up 12 or down 12? Down. So it's got to have a negative 5, negative 12 coordinate. So now when they ask for the sine, which is opposite over hypotenuse, your opposite side is negative 12 over, and your hypotenuse is 13. So negative 12 13 should have been your answer. Okay? The next directrix focus type of question. This is a little bit less straightforward because we're used to, here's your directrix, here's your focus, write the equation. Well, this is saying, here's your directrix, and not here's your focus, but here's your equation. So, again with these, always sketch. So we have y equals 10. And if I get y all by itself, I get y plus 4, and I divide the 12 over, should be 112 x minus 3 squared. Oh, Jacob, I see what your problem was. Why, why, what happened? That's wow. I divided both sides by 12. So that became wait, 1 12. Wait, 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 wait. Yep. Yeah. But you asked a great question, and now I'm seeing how when I rewrote this, I didn't, I, I screwed it up. Because our focus, our, we, we don't know our focus, but given that they gave us the equation, we do know our vertex is 3, negative 4. So 3, negative 4. Now, this should, and your parabolas should always bend away from your directrix, yes? So this is where I screwed up. How did I screw it up? Right, I had it opening. I, so I changed where the directrix was to change the problem, and I forgot that now my parabola should open down. So I'll... I'll be a little bit more lenient on this, but if I, now knowing this, if I'm rewriting it, I should have made that a negative 12. That way that would have made it a negative 112, and then it would have opened down appropriately. And so now your focus is always inside your parabola an equal distance away. So this right here, from 10 all the way down to negative 4, that's 14 units. Do you follow? And so my focus needs to be 14 units further below that. So it's still going to be at 3, but this was negative 4, and I have to go 14 units more, so it's going to be 3, negative 18. Well, we didn't know that. Okay. Yep. Three, three. Well, here's the thing. I, I'll probably give it to you for the sake of, but I do want you to know this. It always goes, the vertex is in the middle, the focus is on one side, the directrix is on the other. The vertex has to be in the middle. So if you, 
Okay, so if you put the, if knowing that this is the vertex and this is the director, if you put the focus in the middle, that's not right. The focus is not in the middle. That's what I thought. Okay, but because I screwed up and it was a little bit, it wasn't a consistent problem. Um, yeah, yeah, I will, I will allow that. But know that the focus is not what's in the middle, it's the vertex that's in the middle. And normally we're given the focus, we're given the directrix, so we go right in the middle. But if we're given the vertex and given the directrix, we have to find out that's six units away that way, so I've got to go six units uh, the other way. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, and on this last one, and this is going to... this. Should have been an easy question on last year's region, but I also, we also probably 90% of the kids lost a point on it, and I think it was only a two or three point question. And the reason they lost a point is because they confused the method of solving a rational with proving. Proving just means simplify. Simplify the left, which you can't do anything to, it's already simplified. And simplify the right and cross your fingers that they're equal. And then when, when they are equal, you just put a check mark and say, yep, it's proven. So to simplify the right, we obviously have to add the fraction. So if I put this over 1 and get a common denominator, x cubed plus 8, x cubed plus 8, my numerator becomes x cubed plus 8 plus the 1 all over x cubed plus 8 which then when you combine the terms in the numerator, you get x cubed plus 9 over x cubed plus 8. And they equal, check, it's proven. But a lot of people cross out the denominators. You only drop the denominator if you're solving. That's a solving technique, right? So x over 7 equals 3 over 7 if you're solving an equation and the denominators are both 7, then you can say, okay, x equals 3, and that's your solution, because you're solving. Dropping the denominators is a solving technique. If you're just simplifying fractions, like if I do 5 elevenths plus 2 elevenths, if I'm just simplifying this, what is 5 elevenths plus 2 elevenths? 7 elevenths, not 7, right? I don't drop the denominator when I'm simplifying. Okay, so... I put this one on here so I made sure we talked about it because you cannot drop the denominators when you're simplifying. That's a solving technique only. Cross multiplying. That's also a solving technique. When you are simplifying, you are just simplifying the left as if the right-hand side doesn't exist and simplifying the right-hand side as if the left-hand side doesn't exist and then hopefully they're equal. But there is no doing the same thing to both sides. There is no cross-multiplying, and there is no dropping the denominators. All of those qualify as solving techniques, not proving techniques. Does that make sense? Okay. I also wanted to show this one. This is not proving anything. This is illustrating that at one particular x value, I'm not sure this person looks like they chose an x value of 3, Okay, they plugged in a 3, and they showed that it did work for the number 3. So they illustrated that it worked for 3. Proving is proving that it's going to work no matter what x is. And there's no way to do that, because this person could plug in a 3 and show it works. They could plug in a 4 and show it works. They could plug in a 5 and show it works. But there's no way anyone in the world, because there's an infinite number of numbers, has time to prove that every single number works. Because you'd have to check 1.1 and you'd have to check 1.2. Versus when you do it generically, that's proving that it works no matter what x value it is. This person just showed and proved that it worked when x was 3. But they didn't prove that it worked for all x values. Okay? It's still a point, but not full credit, unfortunately. Because you have to understand the proof concept. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Um, flashcards. Here is number one.
here is number two. You're sketching a picture for this one. Here is number three. Tell me what the variables stand for here. Not X and Y, but the other variables in this format. Tell me what they equal. Here is number four. This one again, I'm looking for the picture of it. And here is number six. Okay, pass those forward. Do you still have yours over there? Yeah. Okay. Log format into exponential. It's your B raised to the Y power equals X. B to the Y equals X, right? Your base raised to the other side equals X. Your exponential parent graph looks like this. Couple key things here. Why am I just getting this now, Jacob? I don't know because I didn't know. I wasn't looking. Um, so on this one, y equals b to the x. I didn't make you write that, but that's your exponential parent graph format. And couple things. This cannot cross the x-axis because the x-axis is an asymptote and we have to be going through the point zero, 1. Now that could change a little bit if I do y equals 3 times b to the x, then I've stretched it vertically by a factor of 3, and that jumps up to zero, 3. But for the parent graph, before any transformations take place, that's at zero, 1. The average rate of change is just the slope. So you're definitely going to have a rate of change problem on your regions, I would think. I don't know in what context. Sometimes they have you compare a couple different rates of change. That's more like the higher level than Algebra 1 is just to make you compare rate of change from a picture, from a graph, meaning, and then compare it to the rate of change um, for a formula and so on. Exponential function format. So not the parent graph, but the function format. This is y equals a times b to the x. So when I say that you have to tell me what the variables mean, not x and y, I'm talking about a and b. b is the multiplier or the growth factor, and a is the y-intercept. And when you're, you're, when you're asked for function formats, you have to tell me what these non-xy variables stand for. And then the radical parent graph, just looks like this. There's no asymptote here, but it is a dead end at zero, zero. There's your radical parent function. Now again, 
I can put a 3 out in front and stretch it by a factor of 3. I can add 5 at the end and shift it up 5. I can add 5 underneath the radical and shift it left 5, all that transformation stuff. And then period in trig, period equals 2 pi over b. Any questions? All right. Um, questions from last night's homework that did not show up on the quiz. Sarah? 19. Let's see here. Yeah. 19. Let me just get my self organized. June 2016, number, now, oh, I like this one. I starred this one. We're lucky we avoided it. All right, so this is a circle. When you see x squareds and y squareds, it's a circle, but it's not in our standard circle format yet. This is something that needs to be changed into our standard circle format. Remember that our standard circle format is, and it's on a flashcard, but it's this x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. I think. Did I put that on a flashcard? Did I not put it on a flashcard? I might not have. If I didn't, I'll add it on Friday. Is that on there? Oh, I don't think it is. Flashcard add-ons. Circle format. And that's it. X minus H squared plus Y minus K squared equals R squared. And you would have to tell me what the variables stand for other than X and Y. HK is the center, just like HK is the vertex in a parabola, and R is your radius. Okay? So, in order to, this is like the completing of the square process. Now, you cannot complete the square with a coefficient on your x squared and y squared. So there's a couple ways we could do this. We could, and I'll do it this way now just because some other people this morning, I showed them a different way. We could factor a 4 out of there, and you're left with x squared minus 6x. And then in the second grouping, because you can't have a 4 on your y squared either, we would factor out a 4, and you'd be left with y squared plus 18y equals 76. You just get rid of that. Okay? Now, we have to complete the square. Molly, what's going to be the magic number in this parenthesis that's going to complete that into a perfect square trinomial? What number do I add? Okay. Nope, Jake Phillips, tell her. A 9. You take half of negative 6, which is negative 3, and you square it. Now, here's the trick. Because I factored out a 4, I'm adding a 9 inside of a set of parentheses that's being multiplied by a 4. So what did I really add to the left-hand side? If the 9 is going to eventually be multiplied by a 4. 36. So to counter that, I have to add 36 on the right. Now what I just did by adding that 9 is I made this factorable into x minus 3 times x minus 3. In other words, x minus 3 squared. <clears throat> Molly, try again. What's the magic number I'm going to add inside here? 81. Very good. So I, half of 18 is 9. Squared is 81. 81 is also in a set of parentheses that's getting multiplied by 4. So chance, what did I really add to the left-hand side? 324. So I've got to add 324 to the right-hand side as well to make up for that. So then I have plus 4, and then this now factors into y plus 9 and y plus 9, a.k.a. y plus 9 squared, equals, and all of this on the right adds up to what? 436. All right. <coughs> and then my circle is centered at 3, negative 9. And I have a radius of mm, well, I can't really tell the radius yet because I'm not supposed to have a number in front. 
And they actually didn't ask me that. They just kind of asked me which one it would equal. And it is number four. If they did ask me for the radius, though, I would have to divide everything by that four. And I could have done that right from the start. And then it would be x minus 3 squared plus y plus 9 squared equals 109. So my radius would equal the square root of 109, whatever that is. But they just wanted what's the format that's the same equation. And that would be option four. Riley? Well, I didn't divide by 4 right from the start. If I had, I would have. If I divided everything by 4 right from the start, I would have. But I didn't divide by 4 till down here, so there was no 76 left. What do you mean? Right, I factored a 4 out of this one, and I factored a 4 out of this one. And that was only because I can't complete the square until the x squared is all alone or until the y squared is all alone, I didn't have anything to get all alone over here. Does that make sense? Okay. Other questions? Cool. 37. Aha. Uh -huh. All right. So in 37, a lot of reading, but they essentially tell you what equation to use. They are telling us that the breakdown of a drug is represented by this function. And they go ahead and they tell you what every single variable stands for. N of T is standing for the amount left in the body. N sub 0 is the initial dose. R is the decay rate. And T is the time. So they tell you the information for patient A and for patient B. And they ask you to write two functions. So our patient A function is going to be a, a of t. So rather than n of t, we're going to do a of t. So a of t equals, what was a of t equals, what was the initial dose for patient A? 800. E is not a variable, right? It's a number. To the negative, what was the decay rate? What was our R value for patient A? 0.347 T. And then for patient B, following the same, we started with a dose of 400. And our decay rate was 0.231. So the negative is a part of the function. R is 0.231 T. So that was good for a point. Just writing those in there. Okay, just kind of filling them in. Graph each function on the set of axes. So I would use your calculator and your knowledge of the exponential parent graph, right? We just kind of talked about this. Y equals A times B to the X, right? A is your what? Y-intercept. So this one has a Y-intercept of 800. This one has a Y-intercept of 400. So when I type these in, I want my Y max to at least be 800. Your Y coordinate is telling you how much of the drug is left in the person's body. So someone takes a dosage of 800 milligrams and then it just decreases from there. Your X coordinate is T, is time, the number of hours. We don't need any negative hours there. So I'll just go from zero hours to 10 hours. If I need to expand that, I will. So I type in both of these, 800, then my E, to the negative 0.347x. My second equation, 400 e to the negative 0.231x. So here are my two graphs. And I want to make sure I scale my graph appropriately. Okay, Label which, which graph is which one. So label this graph A of t. Label this graph B of t so that we know which is which and also scale appropriately. So if I need this to go up to 800, can I count by 100? I would do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I can. I should even probably count by 200. Or every other one's 100. 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800. Okay. Most important about this graph is probably where they're crossing. 
right? That's usually the case when you graph two functions. So second trace intersect option five. And first curve, it's on, if I scroll to the left, I'll see that it's on patient A, which makes sense because I plug that in first, enter. And then it moves to the second curve, so now it's on patient B, so bring that cursor close to the point of intersection, hit enter. It'll tell you to guess, hit enter. It's going to tell you exactly where they cross, so at, at about five, at about six and a hundred. So at approximately six, and I'll count my hours by one, one, two, three, four, five, six, that 6100 is about where I'm going to have them cross. So the patient A starts at 800 and drops down like this. Patient B starts at 400 and drops down like that. And they're crossing at 6100. Can we follow? Okay. When you're graphing, label your axes. Don't lose points because you didn't label your axes. Number of hours. Um, milligrams in system or something. To the nearest hour, T, when does the amount of the given drug remaining in patient B begin to exceed? So in patient B, it seems it's lower, 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 but right when they cross, all of a sudden B is higher, higher, higher. So the closest hour, six hours. So far so good, Cole? Any questions up to that point? Okay. And then the last one is a question just regarding patient A. The doctor will allow patient A to take another 800 milligram dose of the drug once only 15% of the original dose is left. Well, what is 15% of 800? 0 0.15 times 100 times 800. So 15% of 800 is 120. So the doctor will allow this person to take another dose once there are only 120 milligrams in their body, a.k.a. 15% of their original amount. So if we go to our A formula, we are trying to find when there are only 120, we said, left. So 120 equals 800 e to the negative 0.347t, and we solve. This is solving an exponential, so we're going to need to use logs, yes? First, we divide by 800 on both sides. We're going to get 0.15 equals e to the negative 0.347t. What do you do to get rid of an e? Natural log would be easier. We could still log both sides, not the end of the world if we do, but the nice thing about natural log is that that whole thing will cancel. So it will be the natural log of 0.15 equals negative 0.347t, and you're trying to get t all by itself. So divide both sides by negative 0.347. And the natural log of 0.15 divided by negative 0.347 will give you, and they said to the nearest, tenth of an hour, so 5.5 hours. By the way, this did not, I wanted to review it anyway, but it did not say algebraically. So if I wanted to, I could clear out patient B, because we only care about patient A, and we're waiting until that equals 120. If you graph that, there's patient A's amount. Here's going to come across 120, and then just find out where they intersect. Second trace, option 5 intersect, nearest tenth, 5.5 hours. They did not say algebraically, so we didn't have to worry about that. Um, a title? Sure, put it. It's not going to hurt, so if you think of it, do it. I, I don't know. Depends on who's grading it. I would say, if they don't have a title, who cares? Right. It kind of depends on the test. And I honestly, I don't think so, but I'm not positive. Go ahead and pass your homework forward. Uh, no, just do today. Unless it's all in the same, then you can. I don't, I don't mind that. Tonight? So tonight we're moving to August 2016.
Usual numbers. Usual numbers. The first section of numbers. One, 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 ten, twenty-five, twenty-eight, thirty-three, thirty-four, right? I believe so. It'll be online if you need to double check. I did the wrong one last time. Mm. Molly, you're sinking. No. You're a sinking ship. What's going on? I'm going to start coming again. Mm -hmm. I've been going to TLC in the morning. But. Should I come here? Mm, you definitely should come here. Are you done by the time you go to TLC in the morning or are you still working I'm through still it? Working on it? That's, That's the why problem. I don't come here. I know, I yeah, get it done at night to the best of your ability. Yeah. Then it's like 15, 20, 21, 27, 29. Like, I don't know. Like, the past like couple times, like, I just had like so many questions that, like, I just didn't. And it's like once the TLC is because I knew, like, I should know that. Mm -hmm. We'll start in study hall. And then after school, we'll hit your first round of questions. Okay. And then do the second, maybe half of the assignment at home. And then whether it's a TLC or me tomorrow morning, then we'll hit the second round of questions. Okay. Just a plan for that you'll have a lot. Okay. Six? No. I'm three. One, three, five, eight, eight. Um, I might come after school. I just have a question. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So, I'm having issues with my calculator, and that's the graph that came up, and I'm going to... I even like to parentheses for every time. I think if you put parentheses around the exponent. I just did and I like Uh, you're still recording. Okay. Thank you. I'll get it. Okay. If I put it around the whole oh, the whole that's like doing like Because I'm I'm nervous it's bringing it to the negative point three four seven. Okay. And then multiplying the entire thing by but X. So okay. this all of this is just a number times X, okay. which is why it's a straight line. So if I insert Parentheses around the whole thing that should fix it. Okay, so just like the parentheses. No, and you know what? Right, it's, it was raised to the number. Yeah, and then multiply. And then.